Excellent. My uncle was murdered by the British Army on Bloody Sunday. Uh, he was the same age as I am now and had six kids um, when he was shot in the back and killed. He would have survived if the British Army had allowed first aid to get to him. Um, one person went out to try and go to his aid who also had six children and he was shot through the eye and was killed as well. So my life and my family have been kind of overshadowed by that and our family were one of the founding families of the Bloody Sunday Justice Campaign. So that's my background, but for Derry, that's not that strange yeah. <laughs> a background. Yeah, I yeah. wasn't even the only child in my class who was a Bloody Sunday relative. Really? So it was... You could just you know, look around, there were so yeah, many people yeah, who were Yeah, everyone had lost someone. Yeah, not even just that day, but there was most people knew someone or related to someone who had lost someone in the troubles in Derry. So to give people an insight into that and mm -hmm. to a lot of a younger generation, I'm sure was a reason why you decided to do the book. Yeah, I find and I have found, and I've talked about this publicly before, but there is a real lack of knowledge about the North and about the troubles. And I don't blame people for that. It's not taught in schools, so I don't expect people to know anything um, about the troubles. And I think the rise of Sinn Féin and everything you know that's happening in politics at the minute, more and more ignorance is being allowed to win out. And that comes from me, from one side of because I'm from Derry and because my uncle was murdered, then I must be a shinner. Mm. And then if you're a, like unionist, people become nearly caricatures of what people think the DUP are and Orange Men are. And I was very aware that as more popular Sinn Féin became, there hadn't been a real contemporary book about where Sinn Féin came mm -hmm. from. And like I said that like before, but I didn't set out to change anyone's mind about Sinn Féin. It was more to give the context of where they came from, who they are, and how they operate. And I think that's what people were really wanting. Like I didn't go on to say they're the best party in the world or the worst party in the world. This is a history of where they came from since the hunger strike in 1981. And the one thing that you would do as a journalist is approach people to have a yes. chat with you. Mm -hmm. And you did a approach Mary Lou Macdonald quite a long time ago when yeah. you were going to do this book. What happened? So she was the first person I told uh, that I had the book deal. Before. I told my mum and my daddy and my partner at the time. And then the next person I told was Mary Lou Macdonald. Of course. Uh, we were in the car park in Leinster House. It was around mm, April, May time. Um, and I had said, dear, listen, as the leader of a party, I want you to know, I don't want you to find out from anyone else. But I've been offered to write this book by Penguin and I would like some cooperation and I want to speak to the main players. And she said something, you know, your parents must be very proud of you, that sort of thing. She said, let me talk to Michelle and Pierce. And I said, right, that's grand. And then the only way I can describe it then from then on over the next two years was obstructive or unhelpful at best, obstructive at worst. Mm. So I was given the runaround for quite a long time by the press office. I eventually received an email from Sinn Féin's solicitor um, tell me that they wanted to see extracts from the book, which I ignored and then printed out and put as the second page of the book. And yeah, it just became incredibly difficult. People were ignoring me. TDs blocked my number in some instances. Couldn't get a text back. You got a nickname. They, they gave me a very um, not nice nickname. On Naharniva. Yeah, the poison snake. Oh. Yeah, wow. but I did make a bet with myself that if I became a bestseller, I would get a snake tattooed on myself. So that's what I'm going to do. Right, okay, so you do it straight after, right? <laughs> okay, well, we'll be interested to see that. Watch the space. Uh, yeah. But, because we had Mary Lou McDonald on last week, mm, and she is, um, you know, very charismatic, and, yeah. gets, and she made a big appeal to the young people in Ireland or whatever else. So kind of, she's very good at getting her message across. Yeah like Michelle and Pierce, whatever else. Mm -hmm. So getting a story to give the insights and the history of where Sinn Féin, you can probably understand that they wouldn't want to do that, can you? No, to, to be honest, like it's ironic I called the book the long game because I actually felt this was very short-sighted. But what I would have expected or hoped for in any case would that they would have been offered up a number of people to say, this is my experience in Sinn Féin, you know, and because this has made them actually look worse. Okay. Now this makes it look like if you go to this this measure to ensure that I don't speak to anyone, what have you got to hide? This is a party that's looking to go on to government and they are this afraid of transparency. And we are talking about transparency continually in this country at the moment, mm -hmm. even when we're talking about COVID. We've yeah, got we're Leo back, talking about, back COVID talking about COVID and decisions that were made. But let's talk about someone who has been a huge figure in Irish political life mm -hmm. for a very long time, Gerry Adams, whose voice was not allowed on the BBC for yeah. years. Um, a man who's enigmatic, a man who um, straddles 
two very different sides of a political divide, that of violent and non-violent conflict. Mm -hmm. So uh, the, his membership of the IRA, which is something that he still denies. Yes. You go into all of this and his yeah. ties of Sinn Féin because he did turn it into legitimate political party and yeah. then Mary Lou took that there and ran be, with it. There is no doubt about it. There would be no peace process without Jerry Adams. Now, a lot of people would argue that, you know, the role of the IRA kept the, like, the troubles going for longer, but without Jerry Adams, there would not be a peace process. That is a fact. Now, he didn't do it alone. He obviously, there was a lot of other people, Don Purvis, Martin McGuinness, Berta Hare and Tony Blair. But Jerry Adams is a key figure in the peace process. And I know to some people he is the devil incarnate, mm. but without him, there wouldn't have been one because the issue was, and the real challenge was, to get men and women who have lived and died by the gun, people who joined the IRA at 17, who had never had any other job in their life, whose life was violence, who had lost loved ones to the British state, convincing them that peace was the way forward was no easy feat. And to do that without causing a huge split in which there were number, a huge yeah. number of weapons available. Mm. So there, it was not an easy job and definitely deserves credit for that. Uh, also not an easy job is writing a book on yes. a party <laughs> that doesn't want to talk to you, doesn't really want to offer Doesn't want a up. book written. Exactly. Yeah. Did you enjoy it? Would you do no. it again? No, no. Really? Uh, I think maybe if I picked an easier topic next time, it wouldn't be as bad, but I drove myself mad. Uh, the lack of, not just the lack of uh, cooperation from Sinn Féin, but then the obstructiveness, the, nick the yeah. nicknames, knowing that people are talking about you. I suppose um, when you're writing an insider book. Yeah, you know, and you, you know, me. just life becoming very difficult. And like also knowing that when the book came out, half the people were going to say it was too hard on Sinn Féin, the other half were going to say it wasn't you can't, hard enough. You can't, you can't win, win with this yeah. thing. They are the most po popular party in Ireland. Yes. It is Sinn Féin. North and South, yeah. Are they going to get into government? Yes. And do you think that people are going to start looking at them harder as a result of that? And I, uh, that their policies will do what they're saying to do because people think that they're the saviours of what's happening t to this country? The notion that the press don't already treat Sinn Féin differently is laughable. Like, right. as somebody who works in the media, Sinn Féin are treated differently. Now, a lot of people would argue they should be treated differently because of where they came from, because they deserve extra scrutiny, because they have the shadow hanging over them for their troubles. I do think they have made a lot of promises that if they get into government, they are going to have to... Um, keep or yeah. try and keep. They have said, you know, I have uh, extracts in the book where, you know, TD say we need two terms, whether they get two terms or not, because And listen, transparency is a big thing whenever you go into government. Yeah. Unfortunately, you have to be as transparent as possible. Listen, yeah. congratulations. Thank you. And uh, best seller. a best seller, uh, Aoife thank Moore, you. with the long game. Yeah, it goes into so much in this book. Incredibly thank interesting. You. Aoife, thank you so thank much you. for joining us this morning.